Good morning to you all, and thank you very much for coming, for inviting me, and thank you, American Decency Association, for all that you do. There's a lot of bad news out there for the family. Marriage is down, and cohabitation is up. Divorce stands at about 40 to 50 percent in our nation. About half, there's about a half a million children in the foster care system. About a quarter of our children in our nation are being reared by just one parent. And about 40% of our children live in poverty. Abortion is decreasing, thank the Lord, but it's still, we're murdering about almost a million babies in a year. My thoughts, our nation is experiencing a hurricane. So the song that you sang was, we didn't talk about it ahead of time, but it was very, very fitting. The forces of uh, Hollywood and the media, our education system, and just our culture all together are, are doing battle on our Christian beliefs. And there, there's a strong undertow, and they're pulling us, they're trying to pull us away from our Christian moorings. And our families are just like ships being tossed about on the waves and the billows. And we might be tempted to give in and submit and succumb to those waves and billows. But we can't. We can't give up. And we don't have to. We don't have to because God is still on the throne. He rules the waves and the winds. And he's the captain of our ship. So we have a lot of hope in that. We can trust him to navigate through the hurricanes. And we can say, the Lord's our rock, in him we hide. He's a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betide, a shelter in the time of storm. Better yet, he has control of the storm. So whether he sends us storms in our lives, which he often does, or whether he calms the seas, we can trust him either way. Isaiah 25, verse 4, is a very comforting verse. It reads, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. So the good news of the gospel overpowers the bad news that we are surrounded with every day. I'm speaking from the perspective of being a wife and a mother and a grandmother. My outlook is also formed from uh, being a nurse in my early 20s. And um, that profession wasn't suited for me. I found it very stressful and not fit to my personality. So I went back to school and became an elementary school teacher. And um, during that time, I worked in a psychiatric hospital as a nurse to support myself. Both of those professions were more suited and more enjoyable to me than uh, regular medical surgical nursing, but it all feeds into who I am. Um, I taught for five years, elementary school, before I married the BMW, the best man in the whole world, <laughs> and became a pastor's wife. One of the consequences, by the way, of being a teacher is that you, you always feel free to tell other people's kids what to do. Sometimes you have to restrain yourself, but um, it's all for their greater good, you know. But this morning I have the freedom to talk to you about the greater good and to look at the big picture of what's out there. And that greater good begins with reforming our families according to God's beautiful word. We can't fix every broken family out there as much as we would like to, but we can begin at our own home and do everything in our own power to reform our own families. That already is a challenging task. And then we can lovingly pray for the broken families of our nation, and we can humbly be an example to them and to those around us and to try and reach out to them. So in our minds, let's move from the tempest of the hurricane to the peace of a garden. Our families ought to be beautiful gardens where the fruit of the Spirit grows verdantly. I'd like to look at with you first planting the seed, second, nurturing the shoots, third, bearing the fruit, fourth, watching on the wall, and fifth, keeping the gate. So first, planting the seed. 
No matter what our situation is here, whether we're single or married, with children, without children, younger, older, grandparents, maybe widowed, divorced, we all share the same human experience, joys and sorrows. We all need that seed of faith planted in our heart by the Holy Spirit, and we all need to live a life of obedience to God. And we all have some impact on the people that are in our lives and the people around us. So that being said, I'd like to zero in on families. Um, as I was preparing this, I was picturing a few more uh, younger families being in the audience, but there's quite a few of us who are grandparents. So um, some of what I say is related to child rearing, but um, in talking to some of you, um, you have impact in your grandchildren's lives, and some of you are um, almost like a parent in that situation. Um, and as grandparents, we have opportunities for impact in the lives of our children, grandchildren, and maybe in our church community. So I trust that what I say will still apply to you. God's design for families is good. That's a foundation. When we embrace it, we're blessed. When we rebel from it, we bring unrest to ourselves. Scripture is foundational. Our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. A godly man leads his family in a strong way with sacrificial love. And a godly wife respects him and submits to him under God. That's not a very politically correct thing to say, but it's modeled after a church, the Christ and the church relationship. Christ gave his life for the church. Men are called to give their life for their wives, and women are called to submit. I am not sure what the feminists have a problem with. Men are supposed to be men of understanding, according to scripture. And I would rather submit to my husband than have to die for my wife. So I think the women have the easier job there. But anyway, it's a beautiful system. God designed it. And when we follow it, it's wonderful. We, together, we endeavor to honor God in everything we do. If God gives us children, we try to rear them in the fear and nurture of the Lord. And the, the strength of our families is really the backbone of our nation. It's beautiful, sounds easy, but there's a problem, sin. We all have sin in our own lives, and we're impacted by the power of sin around us, and Satan is very willing to bring confusion into our lives and into our families. But God gives us plenty of wisdom in his word to deal with the sin and confusion around us. An example of the garden. If we plant a garden, we start by prepping the soil. We might check the pH, we might add some humus, we till it, get the weeds out. And likewise, in a family, ideally, we start out with preparation. We hopefully marry a believer, and hopefully we're a believer. We use the means of grace, and we're walking with the Lord, having those private devotions, and family worship, attending church, and observing the Lord's Day, and all those things are good soil to bring children into. But they're also the same things that we need to continue. So no matter what age and what station we are in life, those are the things that, that nourish us. Um, the family worship Bible that Bill just mentioned is, is a wonderful tool. And um, that little book that comes along with it um, the Family Worship Bible is published in the King James Version, but if you'd use a different version, then that little handbook is a, just a wonderful tool to have an application, a, a personal uh, note for each chapter in the Bible, and I highly recommend it too. So whatever situation we are in life, those are the places that we go for a shelter in the time of the storm, the church, our own personal devotions, and spending time with God. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. 
for without me you can do nothing. Further on in the same chapter, John 15, Jesus also reminds us of that one crucial ingredient that's absolutely essential for families, and you know what it is. It's love. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Love in the family setting is like water to the plant. Without it, we just wither and die. But with it, we flourish and blossom. The whole testament is based on love. Jesus summarized the law and the prophets, encapsulated it in to love God above all and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus died on the cross because he loved sinners like us. So love is so crucial. It's the glue that holds us together as a family. And it holds us together in a marriage. Moms and dads express that love often in different ways, but it, the children need that love both from a mom and from a dad expressed in different ways. We all have different personalities. We express it in different ways. Whatever we do, we just have to express it to our children. And of course, love, we as adults need love too. I was talking with um, one of our attendees here last night, and um, she and her husband came to Christ partway through their marriage. So um, the impact of their Christianity was not as much as it would, would have been if they had um, started from the very beginning. And I have her permission to tell this story. So um, their children are not walking with the Lord. And of course, they're not uh, rearing their grandchildren in the fear of the Lord. But she does have some impact, and her children allow her to have a Christian impact on her grandchildren. So, so that's good. And she was um, driving here yesterday, and she's, she also has brothers and sisters that are not believers. And her, it was time for meditation as she was driving here, and she was just praying to God, like, Lord, what can I do? What can I do to impact them? And she felt the Lord tell her, love them. Just love them. And sometimes we can't, um, if we step on their toes, sometimes then they won't listen to us anymore. Um, and we don't want to close the door. But we can love them. And that's something that Christianity has on any other religion out there. It's love. And people are touched by love. So love is very important. Secondly, nurturing the shoots. Uh, quite a few years ago, before I knew much about gardening, I planted some raspberry bushes because my husband loves raspberries. But it was so frustrating that these little shoots kept coming up, and I wanted to keep everything neat and tidy, so I had to keep pulling them up. And <laughs> someone's laughing. I told this to a friend, and her eyes got real big, and she says, those shoots are next year's plants, you know. <laughs> you, don't have to, you shouldn't pull them up. You have to nurture them. Well, that's what our children are like. We have to nurture them. They're sitting like olive plants round about our table, those little shoots. And we have to be tender, and we have to nurture them. But they can be naughty, and so we also have to discipline them. And we have to pray for just for balance and wisdom. Um, I have quite a few thoughts here on discipline, but... Um, Quite a few of us are grandparents, so I'm going to just summarize that by saying that as I look back on my parenting, I, I, I made some mistakes, but God was good. He, he made his grace, made them our kids turn out okay. Um, and I'm very thankful for that, and God is gracious, and our kids are gracious too. Um, but if I look back on it, I, I think three things. Catch them being good and reinforce positive behavior. That way you're not always being grouchy. So reinforce positive things. Next, try to prevent things uh, with proactive action. If you see some trouble coming down the road, try and do something ahead of time before it becomes a crisis. And then the third thing would be to have a well thought out plan and rules and guidelines, which have been clearly explained to the children. And then when you have to um, instill discipline, do it. God says, Proverbs says um, to not, uh, or he says to chasten our children while there's hope, 
and to not spare for their crying. If a child is ruled by his own whims and desires and his own will, he's, he's captive. He's in prison to himself, and he's unsettled. But when we can mold our child's will to be submissive to parents and to God, that life is more peaceful, and they're more peaceful. Disciplined kids are happy kids. We can also nurture our little shoots as we go along the way, and this is something more that grandparents can do. Our example speaks volumes, and children are very perceptive. They might not be able to explain what they see, but they are seeing it, and they are being molded by it. They know what our passions and our priorities are. Do they see that we think more of what God thinks of us or what people think of us? Do we put time and effort into the condition of our heart or into the acquisition of possessions? Are we example, setting example of self-discipline and godly habits that we're trying to tell them to do? And are we the same person at home that we are out in public? Hypocrisy is, we just can't do it. Um, there are I think some people use hypocrisy of Christians as an excuse to not follow the Christian way. And yet, if we are hypocritical, it's, it will turn young people away. Teens can smell it a mile away. So let's be humble, and let's be kind, and let's be real. The dinner table is a, a prime spot for imparting knowledge. It's, it's a time of being together. And it's a time where we can uh, teach our children. It's, it's also a time when we're really tired at the end of the day. And, but we just have to be mentally tuned in. If you're, if you're dragging, get a few bites in your stomach and then put forth that effort, whether it's with your children or with your grandchildren, to have dinner time be a time of, of looking at each other, not on, at your phones, of smiling at each other, of talking about how the day has gone, and of talking about your experiences through biblical eyes so that that's a way to teach your children how to um, obtain a biblical and a God-centered mindset. And then continue that education and conversation through family worship. Uh, we always, we eat dinner at the table and then we move into the living room for family worship. We um, take turns reading scripture, and my husband uses those questions at the end of each chapter, and we have a little discussion. We have three children, only one is at home. Still, two are married, but even when it's just the two of us, we still have uh, family worship. We discuss it, pray together, and end with the song. Um, we can, as in a family setting, dad should be the leader, and mom is there to contribute and to um, have the conversation keep going. Um, the first time we ever witnessed family worship was a, a, a family of 10 children, and the dad was just an expert at asking questions for each age group, uh, for each child, and including them all. It's so important. It takes effort. It takes mental investment, but it's so important, and it reaps lifelong benefits. Family worship is probably the most important thing a father can do. In life, we can't prepare for every eventuality. I, after I let my raspberry bushes live, um, they took me to new places. I started out on the west side of the garden, but by letting the shoots sort of lead the way, my bushes ended up on the north side of the garden. I still don't know how Krupp Farms keeps theirs all in a row. I'm going to have to ask them someday. But sometimes we have to go with the flow. God's providence can sur surprise us. Trials come to us in a variety of ways that we would never expect. But God promises to help. He promises to be there. And he often draws us closer to him in the process. No affliction for the present seems joyous but grievous, but afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Our children are looking at us during those hard times to see um, what we're going to do and how we're going to react. They're looking to us for strength, and they're seeing how we handle things. 
There's one answer for all of life's dilemmas, and that's to abide in the vine. Just like those little tendrils of the grapes curl themselves around whatever's supporting them, so we have to wrap ourselves around the God who loves us. And the same one who plants us is the one who nurtures us and waters us and upholds us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Third, bearing the fruit. When we abide in Jesus and he abides in us, then we will bear fruit. That's what John 15 says. So what does that fruit look like in the context of reforming our families? I'd like to take each of the fruits of, the, of Galatians 5 briefly and offer some practical ideas of how we can put into practice each one of these in the garden of our family and beyond. Love. Affection in the home is, is so crucial. It's even crucial in a scientific, um, anatomical way that children need affection. As we grow, as our children grow, that affection changes in character but should never stop. Love has uh, a way of multiplying. I heard of a family who had a lot of children and someone asked them, how do you divide your, your love between all those children? And the parents said, we don't divide, we multiply. So that's what love does. We can share our family love with others. And we can do that by helping out a neighbor if someone's sick, bring them a meal, do some maintenance, some handiwork around the house. Children see that, and they can also be involved in it. And that, that speaks to them, that hopefully will become a lifestyle for them. We can speak up for the, the voiceless unborn. And not only to be against abortion, which we all are, and to be active in fighting abortion, but what do we do with all these women who are in problem pregnancies? They need help. And maybe we can't do it each individually on our own, but there are organizations out there that are doing that already. And if we put our support either financially or with prayer or, or with actually being involved, we can support those women who need our help. That baby is already in the womb, and the circumstances of that woman's life are, are dire sometimes. And if we can help, that's, that's what God wants us to do. Um, bike and hikes, um, just being aware, all those ways of support are important. In Grand Rapids, there's an organi organization called Garden of Hope, and they have a, a memorial and a cemetery for uh, aborted babies. And they also they have the Omega House, which is right next to the only um, abortion clinic, medical abortion clinic left in Grand Rapids. Fortunately, that is shut down right now because Dr. Gordon um, got accused of uh, beating up his wife. Imagine that, life of violence. And he's, he's had several um, convictions of um, assault so he is on leave right now. So no abortions, medical abortions are happening in that building right now. Thank the Lord. But anyway, the Garden of Hope, um, they try to stop abortions by um, sidewalk counselors on the wall, talking to those women that 30 seconds before they enter the building. They also offer um, conferences, um, weekend retreats for women who've had abortions and who have remorse, remorse for it and are suffering because of that and they do purity uh, conferences. But of the hundreds of churches in Grand Rapids, there's about 10 of them that support them financially. And I, I don't know why more don't, but they, um, Mary Verwise is the woman who's at the head of that, and she said they just have a hard time getting pastors and churches involved. And I don't know why, there's something wrong with that, but I, I challenge you and I challenge me to, to get involved in that movement, and, or some movement that's pro-life and helping women in need. It's a battle, the battle against abortion is one that we're slowly winning. There are many young people who are seeing what abortion really is, and when you show them and tell them what it is, many, most people will say, wow, I didn't know that's what abortion was. And we're winning the hearts of the people. It's slowly, slow, but it's happening. The next fruit is joy. The only real joy that we can ever have is joy in the Lord. 
and that joy can emanate from us in our family and to all that we meet. It's something that glows inside of us. You know the saying in the home, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And that's true. But if we turn it around, if mama's happy, then everybody's happy, usually. So cheerfulness and optimism by mama does have a, a it sets the tone in the family. You know that. It's hard sometimes. The life of being a mom and a wife is, I mean, it's challenging sometimes. But pray hard. And worst case, fake your cheerfulness. <laughs> I always say faked cheerfulness is better than letting everything burst out of you. But then just when the next chance you have, just pour your heart out to God. He understands. He knows what's in your heart anyway, and tell him. But by being a branch that stays connected and stays close to that vine, that's the best and only way to let the joy shine out of us and that the joy of the Lord will be our strength. If Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for our sins and heaven is our destiny, then there's plenty of reason to be joyful. We just have to see those things in the midst of daily life. So let's advertise the gospel to our family and to those around us by being joyful and by always being ready to give an answer for anyone ask, who asks for the hope that lies in us. The third fruit of the Spirit is peace. When the waves and the billows hit us, whether it's through providential events or through unfair treatment from other people. Your kids are watching and other people are watching, especially non-Christians are watching you. Keep calm and carry on was the mantra of Britain in World War II in case the Germans would invade. But we can do better than that. We can do better than stoicism. God promises that he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. He also says, that verse was from Revelation, the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So if we can remember that Jesus Christ is our shelter in the time of storm, then that will bring peace to our hearts and thoughts and actions. The fourth fruit is long suffering. Have you ever wondered why it is that the people that we love the most, our family members, are the ones that irritate us the most? Maybe it's because we know them so well or because we take them for granted. But whatever reason, I think in, within the family, sibling rivalry is probably human nature at its everyday worst. If we learn to be long-suffering at home, I think we can be long-suffering anywhere. If we rear our children to love each other, then we've accomplished a wonderful thing. I've met some parents who, um, who say, well, we just let our kids just duke it out, take care of their own battles. And maybe there's somewhat of a place for that, but if we see our children or grandchildren being cruel and unkind and unfair, we just have to intervene. It's a, it's a time of teaching. And there are kids who, who just need that teaching and sometimes they need discipline in order to learn it. Some children are, learn, are born with a sense of empathy and some are not. And if they're not, they have to be, have that instilled in them from the outside. Sometimes when our kids would um, misbehave, I would role play with them and we would do whatever the situation was leading up to it and then we would role play what they should have done instead of what they did do. And hopefully that was a way to learn. Um, we would make them say, I'm sorry, and make the other child say, I forgive you. And someone asked me once, well, was it genuine? And I said, probably not. But at least it was teaching them the remorse that they should have felt and it was also laying the foundation for the gospel in which confession and forgiveness is so important. The next fruit is gentleness or kindness. 
Not only should we be long-suffering in the home, but we should, God calls us to be kind at all times, in the home and outside the home. When we praise our children or grandchildren for being considerate and for sharing, that reinforces those behaviors. Um, our tone of voice is an unwritten example of kindness. Actually, the tone of voice speaks even more than the words themselves sometimes. Speaking kindly to each other around the dinner table shows um, to each other and about others, shows compassion for others, <clears throat> shows our concern for them. My dad is a man of few words. He was taught that um, they really, really lived it. In the multitude of words, there lacks not sin. That's, that's the way he was brought up. And he would tell us, if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything at all. So, he's quite a quiet man. <laughs> he's become more talkative as he gets older. But he measures his words, and that's a good thing. And consequently, we were taught to just not talk bad about people, um, especially in front of the kids. And I think that also applies um, to the church. I, we know some families who, they, they seem to always have grievances about the, the church, and they would talk about that in front of their children as they were growing up. And those, their children are not with the church anymore because, at least not with our church, hopefully um, they're with another church. But if you criticize the church to your children, they're going to they're gonna take that over and they're going to have critical thoughts of the church as well. It's not that the church is perfect, but I'm saying don't talk about it with your kids except for maybe when they get older and then in a loving way. The an acronym THINK before you speak. Ask, is it T, true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? And if all those things are yes, go ahead and say it. Galatians 6 tells us, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. So we serve our, our household of faith and then beyond that, everybody. Kindness is something that when you exhibit it to human beings, it, it touches them. There's, uh, kindness is what Christians do or ought to do when they're in the right place. So kindness can be a means to reaching out to hurting unbelievers by showing them the love of Jesus Christ, by going beyond what natural human kindness is. Unbelievers notice that and they wonder and they think, what's different about that person? And that's a, a way that we can draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. The next fruit is faith. Faith has two sides, two facets. When we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we touch him trust him because he has saved us from our sins. And we can explain this to our children and grandchildren as this is what drives us, this is what runs our life, and that can make an impact on them. The flip side of faith is to be faithful, to do what we promised, to do our work, and to be a trusted friend and to sacrifice for others. Next fruit is meekness or humility. Meekness is a fruit that flavors everything we do and say, just like love. We don't have it naturally. We heard about that from uh, Pastor Workman last night. Pride lives in our hearts, so meekness is not natural. But God's grace instills that in us so that we don't boast of ourselves, but we boast in the Lord. We can express humility by serving others in our family and beyond, in, in our church and in our community. And by doing that, we are setting an example for our children, uh, hopefully a lifestyle of serving others. We can visit the elderly with our little children. It's, it's very good for both parties. Um, I have a, a friend in um, Grand Rapids, Linda Lanning. She's a pastor's wife, and she would do that. She would visit nursing homes with her children. And um, her brother said, Linda, your kids are getting older. You're making all the decisions for them. Um, they've got to start making their own decisions. So next time they went to a nursing home, she asked her oldest daughter, Marion, um, okay, Marion, you're getting older. You have to make some of your own decisions. Do you want to go in the nursing home and visit older folks or not? And Marion says, hmm, no, I don't think so, not this time. And Linda said, wrong decision. 
you're coming in. <laughs> and Marianne's all grown up. She's got her own kids now. And what is she doing? She's visiting older people in nursing homes. So lifestyle. <laughs> Dinner time talk is also a way to form attitudes of meekness and humility. If we talk about others with a, a tone of disdain and haughtiness, children are going to pick up on that. They know it. But if we talk about them with love and humility and concern, they know that too, and that's what will form them and form their hearts. The next fruit is, the last fruit is temperance. Self-control can only flow truly from a heart that's controlled by Christ. We want to follow scripture. We love the law. If God is in us, we love the law. Not to merit his favor, but to show our gratitude to him. It shows in how we use our time, what we do or don't indulge in, how we control our words, and how we spend our money, and in many other ways. Of course, we can enjoy the good of our labors, and we can enjoy the gifts of God, but doing so with an eye on loving God and honoring him, and loving and honoring our neighbor. So those are the fruits of the Spirit and some ideas of how to live them out. Uh, next, we need to be watching on the wall. There's enemies all around us. We've been hearing about that the, um, last night. And the enemies of Christianity are, are fierce and numerous. It doesn't make sense. Christianity is a, is a religion of love and kindness, and, but they hate us. They really hate us as if we're evil. It doesn't make sense. But it's nothing new. Jesus said this would happen. Nehemiah experienced it when he was trying to build the wall, but he would not be detracted. He just kept on building. His workmen worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other to defend themselves. And then this show of strength deterred Sanballat and Tobiah from their evil schemes, at least for a while. So that's how we need to work as well. We need a wall of protection around our family garden. And yes, we do have weeds inside, from our own sinful hearts, but that wall of protection, we, we need to defend our children and our family from those who would intentionally harm them. There are some really, really evil people out there. there are pe they're starting insidiously, they've been doing this for many years, erasing God from the history books so that we don't hear about the pilgrims and the Puritans and the cr Christian principles that our country was founded upon. They do it by teaching science in a way that totally denies God and by indoctrinating them in unbiblical views of marriage and shaming them if they don't go along with that, by exposing them to pornography and even by human trafficking. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, Hosea says, and that's talking about knowledge of God. We need to arm ourselves, as it talks about in Ephesians 6, with the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes like the gospel of peace, shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, and praying always. It's a battle. But we're also called to love our enemies and to turn the other cheek and to be generous and kind to them. If it's possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. The best way to love them is to present the gospel to them, and that involves telling them they're sinners. The gospel will touch some, and it will offend others. The Holy Spirit has the rule in that way. But, and since that's out of our control, that's okay, that's okay. But let the gospel offend and, and not ourselves. I think we should not be unnecessar unnecessarily offensive in our demeanor. We should be loving. We should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But if they choose to be offended and if they choose to twist our words, that's, that's their problem. But we speak God's words and let it be. So this leads me to my final thought, keeping the gate. We as Christians have been, we've heard that before, we've been too passive. For the past 40 to 50 years, um, others have infiltrated 
and we have not. We love our Amer America, and we trusted that our leaders would do what was good for us. But today's America is not the America of my childhood, nor yours. Even patriotism, which is a high ideal, has fallen in disrepute. The men and women of the military and, our, um, and the police force are maligned and sometimes even murdered. Working hard at an honorable job and supporting yourself is called selfish now. We're supposed to share the wealth with others. And then those who genuinely need assistance from the government, like mentally ill and the disabled, the truly disabled, and the veterans, they're being just swallowed up by the masses who are unwilling to work but are able to work and who want a handout. Our government and colleges and universities are infiltrated by Muslims who don't want to become a part of the melting pot that is America the beautiful. Instead, they want to, some of them, I, I'm not sure about all of them, but they want to desensitize us to the evils of Islam to first make us tolerant of them and then to not tolerate us as Christians. And they're being successful. Who would have thought that in the space of 16 years that we would go from being invaded on our own soil, losing 3,000 people in one day, that we would now be told by the mainstream media and the culture to be tolerant of the people who attacked us. It's, it doesn't make sense. But God is on the throne, and we can't lose hope. He rules, and he reigns, and he will have the victory. But it is a battle, and we are involved in it, whether we like it or not. We hold our children close to our heart for a while, but then we have to let them go. We pray that they're anchored in the on the scriptures and anchored to the love of family, but we send them out and we pray that they will have an impact in our culture for good. Not that they infiltrate, the word infiltrate denotes hostile intent, but they must permeate with light and with helpfulness and purity and good stuff. We as parents and grandparents have to inspire them to be gatekeepers, to be guardians of the truth, to watch out for evil and to protect our land and our people. If there are soldiers or public servants in our, in our audience today, I just want to thank you so much for serving our country in a direct way. There's a lot of other ways we can serve as ministers, lawyers, teachers, nurses, doctors, business owners. We need to get involved in our local and state and national government to have a voice where policy is made. And we can't underestimate the power of a, a godly and honest mechanic, a, a waitress, a secretary, a clerk, a factory worker. We can all permeate our communities in a good way and for God. Let's be salt on the earth and light on a hill, wherever we are. And those who have um, ability and opportunity, we have to strategize for the future and try to get our country back to the Judeo-Christian values that we were founded upon. And moms and dads, we need to teach a combination of strength and compassion. Love is a powerful weapon, but we also need to stand for the righteousness of God. There's no room for weakness in this battle. In conclusion, to seek as we seek to reform our families, there's one more weapon in our arsenal and one more instrument in our toolbox. As we plant the seeds and as we nurture the shoots, as we bear fruit, as we watch on the wall, and as we keep the gate, we must pray. Without prayer, we are the branch that's not living in the vine. And we will be, we're dead and we will be burned in the heap of rubble. But with prayer, we're alive and we're connected to the source of power, and we're nourished by his war, word and spirit. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We can ask what we will according to his will, in his name, and it shall be done. He promised that. E.M. Bounds said, prayer is the most formidable weapon, the thing which makes all else we do efficient. Each of us can and must pray. Maybe some of you are lonely. Maybe you're a grandparent who's 
days of past usefulness are, are done and you feel like you can't do anything, but you can pray. You can pray and you must pray. Our children need your prayers. Be a prayer warrior. God divine, O refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Thank you.